Currently, she's an assistant professor at ETH Zurich, Switzerland, where she heads the Responsive Biomedical Systems Lab. Uh, she develops diagnostic and therapeutic systems at the nano and micro scale with the aim of tackling a range of challenging problems in medicine. Before this position, she was at MIT working on nanosensors for in vivo tumor profiling, as well as methods to wirelessly enhance drug transport. She has won many awards, including Pre Zonta in 2019 for Women in Science and fellowships and grants from the SNSF, DAAD, Branco Weiss Foundation, and was honored with the distinction of young scientist by the World Economic Forum for her scientific contributions to society. In 2014, she co founded the spin off Magnet Magnabotics that offers electromagnetic control systems for wireless micromanipulation. She earned her PhD with specialization in microrobotics in 2013 at ETHC and a master's in industrial engineering with specialization on microsystems and nanotechnology at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mehmet, for this very, very kind introduction. It's my absolute pleasure to be tonight, uh, tonight on my end and morning your end here uh, to tell you a little bit about engineering micro robots for tissue probing, biosensing, and enhanced drug delivery. Um, we might um, all agree that uh, medicine is moving towards becoming more personalized and targeted. And um, I'm an engineer by training, and I, I believe that towards this goal, we need basically um, more tools for more targeted and individualized um, diagnostics and, um, and therapy. And um, with my micro robotics um, background, I believe that um, tiny robots could, that could roam through the body to detect and um, treat disease um, are, should be a, a step forward towards a more personalized and targeted medicine. Um, and just for a little intro, I think, um, so what shall we, how can we basically design and engineer micro robots for medicine? We just need to make them a lot smaller, right? <laughs> That's apparently what many people think um, how micro robots look like. So this is a Google search res result for um, micro robot. But this is, I guess, as the audience here also uh, <laughs> know, it's not how it looks like at that scale. Um, a micro robot could much more look like that here, um, scanning electron micrograph of uh, silica particles with magnetic nanoparticles um, around um, a system from my lab. But we'll come to um, real micro robots. So, but I, I do want to make that point though, that although they look quite different, um, I, I still consider them as a, as a robot because they follow the same principle from robotics. That is that they're for a certain input um, signal, there is a processing rule applied that leads to a distinct um, output. And now just for a medical micro robot um, that could look something like that, um, the input signal could be a disease signal um, from, um, or yeah, biochemical cue from a diseased environment, like an elevated pH or an elevated enzymatic activity, or an input signal could also be externally controlled through ultrasound or magnetic fields. Then a processing rule is applied that, is, that exploits physical and chemical mechanisms at the nanoscale that could lead then, for example, to an opening of a shell, release of a drug, or also um, release of a, a, a diagnostic marker for uh, information about a disease state. These um, uh, processing rules, the materials design and the engineering con concepts here around, they're all informed by several different disciplines coming here together from chemistry, engineering, physics, and biology. So I really see this field as a convergence of sciences. And that is what I kind of um, live with my, with my lab and team here at ETH Zurich in the Responsive Biomedical Systems Lab, where we are studying and applying different physical cues um, to um, nano and microsystems that we design. Um, so we specifically work with magnetic fields and ultrasound, and um, we are interested in, in different biochemical cues with a focus on enzymatic or specifically proteolytic activity. And today, I just want to give you, um, I basically want to go with you for three, three examples um, using magnetic fields and ultrasound of micro robots in three different distinct applications, basically how we can use them in mechanobiology that to help us probe tissues and learn about mechanics at a cellular scale. Um, an example about diagnostics, how we can use a micro robot um, that can help us to probe locally enzymatic activity for better treatment decisions. And lastly, um, in the therapeutic um, um, application space, how synthetic and living micro robots can enhance drug delivery and drug transport in tissues. So um, let's start with this first project on micro robots that can help us to probe um, tissue models. Specifically here, we're working with tumor tissue models. And this project is led by my PhD student, Daphne Askerson. 
Um, so I think we um, we might all appreciate that, and especially in uh, so in cancer progression, matrix stiffening is is a driver, and um, there's um, several um, so this um, manifests then also in a tissue stiffening that can be um, that can be um, that can be experienced and felt at a macro scale, but also, of course, leads to a whole um, pathway um, and a cascade of pathways at the cellular scale um, through um, a stiffening of the collagen matrix, for example, a major co uh, constituent of um, the extracellular matrix and cells that um, are attached to, to collagen for integrants and communicate through um, the collagen network. Now, um, there are, um, we might also appreciate that this, um, the stiffening or the tissue properties um, um, actually varies or the mechanics vary across the length scale. So if we um, assess also um, shear modulus from the data we get from bulk rheology measurements um, at a macro scale versus single fiber analysis of pulling on single collagen fibers, we experience here a, a wide span of um, shear moduli that, that um, are measured in experience. And we're particularly interested really at the cellular scale, what are the, the shear modu moduli that a cell embedded or in, in um, um, yeah, living in, in this matrix is basically experiencing. There are different um, uh, techniques to assess then um, uh, the microscale mechanical properties. We can work with an atomic force microscope and do topographical analysis. We can um, work with optical tweezers that can also be applied in situ, however, have some limitations because of the um, um, opaqueness of tissue. Um, there are magnetic tweezers um, um, that can be applied with um, either a lot actually um, has been done in the field using um, uh, using spherical particles, um, traction force microscopy or, or, or microological assessment. Here um, we are basically um, uh, we're interested in, in, in applying magnetic fields, but not to spherical particles, and instead work actually with um, uh, micro cylinders as, as little micro probes um, as we can through the shape anisotropy get quite um, a lot of rich information um, of the tissue mechanics. And um, so basically the micro robot here would be this um, the cylinder here made from cobalt nickel uh, recently, and they are made basically by electrodeposition in, um, uh, in templates, uh, polycarbonate membranes. Usually now we actually do our own with, um, in soft photography so we can better design um, and define diameters and um, uh, electroplate also um, um, uh, iron, um, iron and iron oxide then. So we, um, but here basically um, what we can do by um, now embedding such um, um, microprobes in collagen is that we can, um, when we're, oops, for some reason, this is this animation should. For some reason, unfortunately, this animation is right now not playing. I tested it before, but what you would see is here basically the deflection of these two um, cylinders as we're modeling basically the dynamic, um, um, the kinetics of the deflection when applying a rotational magnetic field. And the uh, degree of deflection basically tells you about the viscoelastic properties or specifically here as we can um, neglect the viscous components, the elastic components um, of the of the matrix. And um, for this, we can infer a shear modulus by basically mapping um, and measuring the deflection of a magnetic micro rod exposed to a rotational magnetic field in plane. So um, to give you, so this video is luckily playing, to give you here um, a, um, a, a bit of a better picture, we're basically working with such an eight coil electromagnetic system um, I've been working on during my PhD. And that is actually also now commercially available um, uh, from Magnabotics, that uh, company that uh, Mehmet mentioned in the beginning. So this tool can be, um, can basically, uh, the system can apply um, magnetic fields and gradients in 3D um, and can be integrated into um, inverted microscopes uh, here, for example. And what you see here now is a Tamra labeled collagen matrix embedded. We have embedded here cobalt nickel micro rods um, with basically just NHS EDC chemistry coupled to the collagen. So you see this here nicely embedded. And, um, and um, here we basically see nicely the collagen deflection. 
what we've been then, um, and the, the more dense the collagen, the, um, the less um, the particle will be able to deflect. And we can basically um, infer this based on, the, um, uh, based on the energy relation I showed you before, back to an effective sphere modulus that is then, as you see here also, as we analyze all the deflection from, um, from, from rods in a field of view, um, we get then these mean effective shear moduli um, that, that is increasing with increasing concentration as um, expected. Um, although really here, um, this, this result should, take, should be taken with a grain of salt or the, the consideration that basically we're not interested in the bulk value or the mean of these, of these shear moduli as we really wanna look locally into what is happening um, in the vicinity um, of a cell or how, um, um, and, and, um, and as also the collagen, of course, is heterogeneous, uh, quite heterogeneous in, in its stiffness um, across. Um, and what uh, we in the study that we recently, recently published, published in lab on a chip, um, we're also really interested about because we found actually quite high values, a shear, shear moduli um, for our magnetic micro rods. And we saw that we kind of here in this Tamara labeled collagen, so quite a densification of collagen around a micro rod. And we were wondering how does this um, is this an artifact of our measurement or is it um, or do cells may also have an um, densification of collagen around, especially if they're kind of um, well encrafted in the matrix. And so we did some analysis of basically the collagen um, um, concentration by the intensity distribution here at the rims around um, around cells and around our rods and saw a similar actually densification. And we then also modeled that and how it would might um, effect actually um, a shear moduli and could see that this um, can uh, increase a local stiffness by quite tenfold with such a up to a tenfold here with um, um, with such a, such a densification or um, a local sorry, um, up to a fourfold increase of a tenfold um, densification. We also, of course, what should be always considered when doing these experiments in, in, in model systems, that um, if you, you have boundary effects, and here's just also, again, that, of course, boundary um, wall effects by, uh, by rods being rather close to a surface can also in increase the effective shear moduli modulus, and so does, of course, the position um, of a cell within the sample. Um, so what is really also interesting with the system is basically that we can probe um, and mimic also network dynamics and characteristics. And so here uh, we basically um, trace the, um, um, the, the um, deflection of the fibers and movement over time as we were applying these rotational magnetic fields um, and can then also get an idea of, of kind of the length scales um, this applies to and also when, when cells of course um, interact with the tissue um, matrix and apply forces in a similar range because what um, because the forces we can basically apply um, are in the in the tens of piconewton range which is in the in the range of cell contractile forces. Um, and so what's also interesting with the system, and, and here's basically um, um, a representation of that, is that you can apply it in, in 3D. So we can um, basically tilt um, these uh, microprobes out of plane and can deflect um, the tissue in different direction. Might also see an anisotropy of, um, of uh, the experienced shear modulus in different directions. Um, we... Um, have also then embedded um, cells here. So these are just um, labeled HeLa cells. And so here you see that their superposition of the bright field where actually the rod is sitting. Um, so this is compatible also with these cobalt nickel rods, um, uh, at least in the first 24 hours. But as I said, we moved now to biocompatible iron oxide. Um, and we, this is basically new work that, um, uh, that we're now working on and, and studying then um, in context of met metastasis um, and the effect of mechanical forces and distinct, um, distinctly controlled in certain um, proximities to um, spheroids and analyzed then the um, um, impact on, on invasion. Um, so, and maybe to come back to this, but the, the um, as I introduced before, I mean, tissue stiffening is a major driver in, in, um, in cancer progression. And this stiffening, um, but also the change of the extracellular matrix is directly correlated to, um, uh, to, um, to proteolytic activity and the release of certain proteases, particularly, particularly matrix metalloproteinases. And this brings me to the next topic, which is basically on um, uh, how, how could we now um, how could we um, employ basically micro robots to detect potential proteolytic activity as a marker for changes in the 
um, uh, in the tumor microenvironment and part of um, the metas uh, as part of the metas metastatic cascade. So in particular, um, for example, MMP2 is associated with, um, um, with tumor progression and could be a, a great marker for um, um, in, in cancer diagnosis. But really the proteolytic land landscape um, as a hallmark of disease goes across many different diseases from blood, or blood disorders, cardiovascular diseases, inflama inflammatory diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, um, and basically, um, there's really a need of, of finding ways to um, detect dysregulated proteolysis, proteolysis and um, ev ev elevated uh, protease expression. Um, and something crucial here to keep in mind is that we have about 550 proteases in the human body that regulate um, um, healthy processes and, um, of course, in dysregulation and are part of, um, of, dise um, of diseases. Now, this brings us to the problem that basically it's hard to measure this um, on a systemic level. So if you would look into MMP2 in the blood, we would basically have just, um, if you would look for the MMP that is um, MMP2 that is secreted um, in a tumor microenvironment, if you would look for that in the blood, you would basically see a lot of noise from many other healthy processes and organs that shut um, MMP2 into the bloodstream. So there's a need to really assess um, uh, the proteolytic activity locally. Um, there are different diagnostic modalities um, that have been established for protease activity, although this is not um, a, um, a standard, um, standard method of use, um, but there are activity-based probes or that um, are combined with French, um, with French fluorescence or uh, first resonance energy transfer that can be integrated um, into imaging modalities like PET, SPECT, CT, or MRI. But these, um, um, and of course, then also it plays a, a very important role, the detection, because they're also therapeutic modalities that actually um, interact with, um, with proteases um, are triggered through that, um, or yeah, or uh, work on inhibition of them. So um, there's really a, a, large, a, a strong need to find ways of a low cost point of care uh, diagnostics for local um, proteolytic um, um, upregulation. But the current techniques are basically costly. They're difficult also, to use for multiplexing, if you want to use, if you want to look at multiple uh, proteases at the same time, and uh, require quite advanced um, imaging technologies that can also be quite time-consuming. And so here, um, I've been working uh, with my team on a new system that could be used um, uh, to basically enable prote uh, protease imaging for ultrasound. Um, so molecular imaging of proteolytic activity for ultrasound contrast agents. And this project is led by my PhD student, Ragana Ristanovic. And so here we're basically building up on already uh, clinically approved um, ultrasound contrast agents, for example, Sonovu, um, uh, that is, they're usually um, filled with, um, uh, for example, with perfluorotane, um, and then have a shell, a lipid shell composed of DSPC um, and DSPE PEC, um, PEC. Now we've been basically exchanging um, this um, pack with uh, polyacrylic acid um, and to basically give us an um, anchor point for carbodiamation um, um, and integrate a forearm pack amine for cross-linking. Um, and so we, with this cross-linking of a microbubble, basically what we want to achieve, so we, and we have here integrated in this cross-linker um, a peptide that can be basically a substrate that can be, can be cleaved by a certain target protease, is that when we now um, expose such a microbubble um, to ultrasound, basically what a, what a gas-filled microbubble would usually do is it starts resonating, it's especially then, I mean, it starts oscillating and um, you have a very strong signal as its resonance frequency. Now we constrain basically this oscillation, um, which basically brings down its um, attenuation, so the attenuation of the acoustic signal. And now if this protease, a target protease um, of interest is active and cleaves off um, the shell, we basically um, release um, um, and bring it back into its, its oscillative um, state and, um, and have um, um, an, 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 a decrease of the attenuation. So we have a strong bright signal basically coming up and an, um, a less attenuated signal. And um, so how, um, here just a little background on basically how this is done. So we, we work with this polyacrylic acid functionalized microbubbles. 
um, and um, uh, can actually studied very um, intensively then um, how the cross-linking really affects the attenuation and restricts this oscillation. And so we um, here you see first that basically we could integrate polyacrylic acid um, um, as we then were um, adding um, cell free to label this. And you can see that we basically could successfully uh, get this chemistry onto the bubble. And um, now we studied um, how the cross-linking really modulates the mechanical prop properties of microbubbles. And so we, for that, we basically looked into um, an increased number of um, links that we could introduce based on the crosslinker concentration and also different designs of the crosslinker. But here you can already see quite intuitively that with an increase of the um, crosslinker concentration, thereby providing more links, um, we could basically um, decrease this attenuation basically as we're restricting more and more the bubble and the acoustic signal is less attenuated. So um, through this um, constraint. Um, and now, oops. And now you can see the equivalent of, um, of such a, a measurement, which can be nice to done in our lab because we basically, my PhD student built a transducer chamber where we can send in acoustic, um, acoustic waves and then measure the attenuation um, on the other end of, of, her, of the class chamber as it's traveling, the acoustic waves are traveling through um, our microbubble solution. But this is then um, an ultrasound image that we recorded in, in phantoms of these microbubbles with, with um, either um, no links, so not cross cross linked or here with these 16 links and you can see basically that we get um, a quite a high increase of, um, of signal when um, for an unconstrained um, or a very strong difference between the constrained and unconstrained state. And um, as mentioned, we then looked into basically variations of this crosslinker architecture. So here you see um, the relative uh, change in attenuation when we work with a short two-arm linker um, that is then um, uh, we can, this is changed and shifted if we um, integrate a, a longer um, linker or then also with a form as we can, um, that has done more, um, can, can basically densify this more as it has more, um, also provides more anchor points. And um, uh, interestingly, this, um, this behavior of how this depends on the number of links, so the concentration of the cross linker and the, the structure can be actually quite nicely predicted with graph theory. So here we um, transferred basically the shell into a um, shell, their shell network as, um, um, as nodes um, that can have different amounts of um, different numbers of connections and um, could then basically um, predict how this shell network, um, how connected it would be depending on the number of links and the design of the, um, um, and the, design of the cross linker. And so with that information that really helped us um, or with, with these results that really helped us to inform the design of our microbubbles for in the end proteolytic activity, um, uh, detection of proteolytic activity, we then moved um, into um, integrating a peptide crosslinker um, with the same chemistry, but including now basically a, um, a peptide. And, um, and here uh, we're interested um, uh, specifically to start with basically um, selective for chemotrypsin. And so basically um, first we, um, um, we showed here that um, for, a, for, a, for pepsin, where we should have no activity at, um, at pH seven, that we really didn't see a change in the acoustic response. And proteinase K is a very non-specific protease that basically right away then also um, as a positive control um, could um, very swiftly um, cleave and we got an, um, here a strong acoustic response. And then here basically for our target, um, 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 and here we could basically see how, how um, uh, the acoustic response was then um, could be uh, tuned by um, or detected a different concentration of here also proteinase K um, um, and its increase as you can basically resolve the kinetics and potentially hopefully would this lead them to um, be able to, um, to get an idea of levels of molecular activity in vivo. So these um, are of course, this is not yet or not of course, but these results are all um, in, in vitro. We're now moving to um, for samples actually of um, patient samples of synovial fluids as we're interested in and in potentially applying this in, detect in, in context of um, inflammatory diseases of the joint. 
Um, uh, to put this also in context, there is, uh, up to our knowledge, there's you no know, other um, uh, micro bubble based uh, protease um, system um, um, out, but there is um, from um, uh, from uh, uh, Mikhail Shapiro's group, actually a very interesting acoustic bi biosensor-based system, um, also for detection of enzymatic activity uh, through encoding of, um, of peptides in, um, in vesicles of, of bacteria. And so here, um, uh, this is there's right now really, a, this was just published in Nature Chemical Biology in 2020. And um, there's really a lot of momentum in the field of finding ways um, for detecting proteolytic activity um, um, in situ. So with that example of a micro-robot that basically communicates information about a disease state um, um, acoustically, I want to move now to um, the next topic, which is on how can we, if we know then about a basically a dysregulated state, or potentially about um, 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 uh, the, the, potentially with a, with a cancer diagnosis, how can we now move to more um, effective um, therapy? Um, so, especially in cancer therapy, we have a rich portfolio of approaches. Um, I'm just checking in a minute how I'm doing with time, so that looks good. So, we're having um, definitely a rich portfolio in cancer therapy. The current standard of care is still surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy, but then combined with really um, um, a, a large set of, of new modalities, including immunotherapy or um, a, targeted nanomedicine, gene therapy, um, and so on. Um, and especially targeted nanomedicine or nanomedicine has hold um, quite um, great promise um, uh, starting in, in the 60s with um, basically um, the development or the, um, the work on, on liposomes. And liposomes um, or the, the formation of, of liposomes is really what um, has been intensively studied and led and also um, to the first um, FDA approved um, system, actually Doxil in, uh, in the 90s. And since then, um, as you see on this timeline, it's basically a huge development also of um, other polymeric systems and variations of liposomes, um, also some that would, uh, could, um, uh, that are thermosensitive um, and so on. However, um, uh, when um, we're, we're seeing this timeline and all these developments and more sophistication and targeting um, and, and so on. Um, but actually a meta-analysis um, published in uh, 2016 was actually quite um, shocking when kind of reviewing um, over um, the studies published in the field of nanomedicine that kind of revealed that independent of um, really the material, the targeting strategy um, um, and um, and uh, the hydrodynamic diameter or CDAR potential, um, in the end, about only 1% of the injected nanomedicine dose would reach tumor sites in these um, studies that were all on, on animal, animal studies. So, but this is also what we experience in, in clinics that still um, the, the amount of dose that we get to the tumor site and, uh, and um, is still marginal and we have a lot that of course goes to the liver and a high systemic burden. Um, so, and when we, but when we think about how, um, how when we systemically inject um, drugs or um, into the body, what, what are we encountering? Or if you're thinking from an engineering perspective, how could we maybe design tools or when we work with these, with, with nano capsules, what are they experiencing basically in the human body and why do we have so, so little control over it? So um, we have several conditions and obstacles that we need to consider when then thinking about this problem. This is, I mean, our heart is a, is a huge pump that pumps about five to seven liters per minute. We have uh, flow rates um, in the order, for example, up to one meter per second. We have, um, in that sense, mechanical filters from um, uh, dense tissue and ethelial uh, walls. We have immune cells, um, uh, phagocytes that come and, and take up a big portion of, of nanoparticles also detected. Uh, we have this um, dense tissue with a high interstitial fluid pressure. So all of these obstacles that basically work against um, our delivery systems. So, um, but what you see here, um, I think looks might look quite intriguing. What you see here is basically a, um, a micromagnet that is moved around in 3D in, um, in a silicon oil. So this is actually um, moved by the same system I showed in, in the beginning with this eight coil um, magnet. Now, would it be possible to actually have these nano shuttles and power them with, um, with magnetic fields to, um, to a target site in vivo? 
Well, um, I have to say, no, that's not very effective um, because once the, um, what we need um, for this actuation or for such a movement guidance is actually magnetic field gradients and, um, and, uh, and those diminish um, rapidly with um, the distance from the face of a, of a magnet. And then the magnetic force also scales with the, um, with the volume. So for a nano shuttle, um, uh, this is getting marginal. So we have basically uh, the limitation of the magnetic force as it scales with the volume. We have these reduced gradients that we can achieve in deep tissues. And on top of that, we have high fluid drag forces that are dominating as we're entering the low Reynolds number regime. And um, these are very old videos, but I, um, I, I think this is a lot to appreciate here. So uh, from uh, here from, uh, from, from Taylor that uh, recorded in the 60s, where you basically, um, just for, to get an idea of the low Reynolds number regime, um, you see here um, um, a fit, basically a, a fish model system just swimming through water with a flapping uh, motion, symmetrical motion. And when you put now the same device into a high viscous environment, the exact same thing that actually a small fish or like a nano fish would experience um, in water, it, it, would ex it would feel viscous like this, this starch solution. And, um, and so the this, this same motion, the same symmetric motion doesn't move the system any, any further. So basically in the low Reynolds number regime, um, more effective strategies, we need other strategies to move forward that are actually based on non-reciprocal motion. Um, as um, here, um, inertia is negligible, drag forces are dominating, um, and, it's, um, and it's time independent. So um, what you see here is a, is a movie um, of actually a phagocyte chasing a bacteria. So interestingly, bacteria, I mean, as tiny, they're very small, a micrometer, about a micro, or depending on the bacteria, but uh, about a micrometer. And um, they have evolved um, strong molecular motors and have flagellas that are actually that, that exhibiting this non-reciprocal motion. So um, you see this here, they have basically um, a cork, uh, based on a cork, corkscrew-like motion, like a propeller that um, through this rotation for molecular motor lead, um, yields into this translational move, movement forward. And um, this has inspired um, the microrobotics community quite strongly um, and many bio-inspired or bacteria-inspired um, micro-robots have been proposed with different, um, with different um, fabrication schemes, so glanced um, angle deposition, or here also um, other systems that can be now 3D printed with um, uh, two, uh, two photon lithography. And um, so we took such, um, um, we also made in the lab, so this was um, back during, during my PhD time, actually, um, this was with, fabricated by colleagues, basically these um, 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 artificial bacterial flagella. So here basically just such a helix uh, made from a, a photoresist that was then coated with magnetic material. And now again, applying um, with the system rotational magnetic fields and those can actually scale very well with distance. So we can apply, um, if you're not depending on a gradient, but just on a basically um, rotational magnetic field, we can apply this in deep tissue. And so this is basically a strategy to, um, to power systems um, um, also in um, at a, at a further distance with magnetic energy. And so here you see now um, three of such um, artificial bacteria that are um, controlled with these rotational magnetic fields. And um, what, I, uh, what I, was, I was quite intrigued by in experiments is just the effect they have actually on surrounding nanoparticles. So the idea was not to use them as a delivery vehicle, but more like could we kind of use them um, uh, to, to affect the hemodynamics and affect um, or introduce basically convection um, into, um, into nanoparticle transport. So here these are basically what you see in red are um, uh, fluorescently labeled uh, polystyrene nanoparticles, your tracer nanoparticles, and you see such a helix basically drilling its way through and creating this wake and moving uh, these particles sideways. So the hypothesis was can we maybe work against this diffusion limited transport of such nano shuttles um, by introducing an intravascular propeller that induces local convection and pushes these uh, nanosystems out? Um, and so first um, I started basically to um, 
it is wisdom uh, during my postdoctoral time to um, do simulations on um, the, the fluid dynamics. And um, so basically what you, what you can see here is the velocity. So if you're thinking about a small channel like a capillary and we have a, um, now such an artificial bacteria flagella in there and we look into the, um, um, and we're having an incoming flow, the, um, the, the system is basically flow, um, swimming against the flow and would then just maintain steady state um, if you're basically just compensating that incoming blood flow. Um, and then you would have far away from the system, you would have basically um, here this typical laminar flow profile. And then you can see that um, before and behind the system, you can basically alter this, um, um, these, the hemodynamics and push the velocity profile towards the, the boundaries um, where we actually would otherwise have, um, have no, no fluid flow, What's, um, or, or no, no velocity as a stick slip condition. So here um, we, um, and what's most important is of course, the velocity component outside of the, the vessel. So perpendicular to the, to the flow direction here. And so here you can basically see that indeed, while otherwise we would not um, have, this, um, um, have this component, we can basically achieve um, um, velocity components uh, perpendicular to the vessel and, and achieve this um, uh, desired um, uh, flow vector. So we wanted to move into experimental studies and I worked with these um, with a, uh, with basically a tissue um, fluid interface model um, based on um, based on designs from Roger Cam's lab that are now also commercially available. I'm um, here they are self-made basically with these PDMS posts that um, then patterned here on, on glass and then um, you introduce collagen because of surface tension effects you can create and here these um, fluid um, uh, fluid collagen interfaces. So we could basically study transport in between these posts into the collagen for an incoming uh, nanoparticle stream. Um, and this is just then how, uh, what we expected and also from simulations, how would that affect and really here in a vessel tissue model, then the, um, the transport outside between these posts. Um, and then we tried um, with um, basically Allurian and also Langrangian computational modeling um, to, to get an idea of how large this effect would be and how we could um, um, also evaluate an, um, such an experiment. So let's assume we have now um, such a swimmer basically um, in the chan channel position. So these were very tedious experiments um, and had great support from Europe's also at, um, at MIT help, um, also helping with these experiments. We have an incoming, um, we have done an incoming stream here of uh, basically uh, nanoparticles and, um, and would then observe um, the, these regions of interest before and behind and at the ABF and informed by the simulations Basically, we saw that the effect would be um, enhanced at the ABF, but also behind through, um, especially the Lagrangian um, modeling that, that captured quite well this particle distribution and also found that we have an, um, quite an effect behind the, the ABF. So we basically then um, and normalized with the one furthest away and integrated, um, summed up the, um, what we found in, in these regions of interest and uh, compared this to controls that basically no ABF was active. And um, we could find a uh, significant um, increase of nanoparticle um, uh, accumulation in these outlets when an ABF was active um, and could also uh, find it when we did an, a study of the penetration depth that basically we get more um, particles um, pushed, um, we get, sorry, we get them further um, into the tissue. So we, we could basically increase uh, tissue penetration. So we were quite excited about these results, but um, uh, it, um, it should be noted that this effect is actually limited or depending on, on rather small vessels or you for larger vessels, you would need a larger ABF, but it um, depends really on, on that the, the, um, um, the ratio of the diameter of the, of the ABF to the vessel. And so this, this effect is actually um, not significant in larger vessels. And, um, and does this, make, this makes it very difficult to realize this also in vivo, plus also we might suffer from um, agglomeration effects in small vessels if we put more ABFs. And so there was the idea then, okay, maybe we would just have more, um, but um, there are several limitations to that. However, this, this system where it basically um, 
could be very interesting is really as an individual propeller, if it's stationary installed, for example, in a, stat, in, in a stand, um, and you could switch it on to drive the local convective flow on demand um, for such swarming of nanomedicine. But of course, it, it bugged me that it was kind of, uh, we, we would basically, this idea of maybe we should have just have swarms of these ABFs, but how could we um, prevent that they agglomerate? And then I have to say, I was quite inspired by a colleague who was working at a time in the same lab, who was working with real bacteria um, in context of bacterial cancer therapy. And I felt, well, if I could only move, um, yeah, if I could control these bacteria magnetically and not work with artificial bacteria, you know, the, also the fabrication process, processing is getting um, quite difficult if you want to move to smaller scales, let's say to smaller ABFs, but then have more of them. And while it turned out that nature has actually a solution already ready for that, so there exist um, a naturally innately magnetic uh, responsive bacteria. Um, uh, this here is um, Magnetotacticum spirillium um, AMB1. It's a micro aerophilic um, aquatic bacteria that's, um, that's found, for example, actually also at um, Cape Cod on the East Coast. Um, it synthesizes um, magnetite crystals um, contained in these nanoscale organelles, and this has evolved to um, basically aid their navigation. But we can, um, of course, also superimpose the earth magnetic field with, um, for example, um, field generated with the system I showed before, and then um, here orient the swimming direction um, of such a, a bacteria and kind of guide in along directions. But, um, uh, but what's actually even more exciting to me is what happens if you have whole swarms of these and you apply rotational magnetic fields. And that is what you see here. So we see again um, in red, these uh, fluorescently labeled tracer particles that are now mixed with, um, with, um, um, with these magnetotactic bacteria. We are applying externally rotational magnetic fields that we can actually um, apply really at a, at a human scale and deep tissue, and we can generate these large volumetric flows. And um, just to, to make really this distinction, what is happening here, you can have an in-plane um, control by having these guiding magnetic fields, but then you're depending on the, um, on the, on the, um, uh, on the uh, propulsion of the self-propulsion of the bacteria, which is limited to the power of the molecular motor and is actually in the sub, uh, sub piconewton range. Now, um, you can also, by rotational fields in plane, you basically, they will go in circles and the higher the frequency, the smaller the circles, uh, the smaller these circles will get until they actually turn around the axis. But what happens is if you, if you now um, um, rotate them out of plane, you're getting actually um, a surface walking and walking over each other through basically um, then, um, by, by coupling with each other in the resistance and you have hydrodynamic coupling, strong hydrodynamic coupling with the fluid around. And um, this effect um, is here. So basically we then analyze this, um, these ferrohydrodynamics with, ferro, um, with the bacterial swarms. So basically um, the, the velocity we can achieve for different uh, frequencies and at different field magnitudes. So you see then a certain step out frequency where, then the, um, where the fluidic drag force is basically um, overcoming then the magnetic force. So at this point, then we have the step out behavior that can be pushed to higher frequencies and that does higher velocities um, for higher field magnitudes. Um, so basically as then in that moment, we're increasing the magnetic torque um, uh, and the magnetic force that is then counteracting the fluidic um, force. And um, this has been also studied, of course, intensively for synthetic ferrofluids that are composed basically of part iron oxide, mostly of iron oxide nanoparticles, and you see the same behavior. So we basically have here a, um, um, a living ferrofluid in that sense. Um, and so I was quite excited about um, basically this power of transport um, that I could see on these um, uh, fluids hydrodynamic coupling, and we did the same studies in these devices, but now looked at this whole region of interest because basically the bacteria were everywhere. And we could also see a um, significant increase in the nanoparticle um, accumulation in, in, uh, in, in this collagen matrix that we have here in the center. And what's also quite exciting is that we could basically, if we first just let these particles diffuse, we could then on demand start by applying our rotational magnetic fields um, uh, further increase again and drive transport basically beyond saturation. Um, and this was uh, got actually quite some nice uh, coverage for nanoparticles to take a fantastic magnetic voyage and team up with bacteria for their delivery. Um, so just to make that um, 
point also a bit more I'm really excited about this, uh, this strain of bacteria also they, they really indeed outperform actually synthetic ferrofluids so we studied a little bit more in detail the hydrodynamics and um, what's going on here so uh, what's quite interesting uh, how we did that is basically we just um, put them in, in such PDMS pools um, the bacteria and, uh, and um, uh, synthetic ferrofluid and uh, then we studied um, the velocities we could achieve and also um, and how that is spatially distributed. And what we basically saw is that um, uh, not only was basically did the bacteria outperform the ferrofluid in the sense of when we normalize um, to the magnetic material um, that they, um, yeah, when we basically normalize the velocities we achieved to the magnetic material. Um, and what's, what's, what can be also appreciated is that um, the, um, the flow they generate is more homogeneous. And that deals basically with the fact that they do not agglomerate. So they are naturally, um, we have of course dipole-dipole interaction, but they are naturally protected from agglomeration because of their uh, bacterial membrane around. And so um, uh, you can also see that basically after actuation, they would remain with the same size distribution while the ferrofluid actually in part is irreversibly ag ag aggregated and uh, creates these large um, aggregates. Um, now, exciting, uh, we took the, so probably great to see, um, hopefully these results are convincing that it's a, a very good ferrofluid um, for transport, but you might ask yourself, well, okay, um, but you really wanna put this into, um, how would this work in vivo, right? Um, but here I have to say that actually um, using bacteria in a fight against cancer um, is, is not you. And we can, uh, we can think about li using living organisms um, as micro robots are here to drive transport. Um, and so this actually goes even back until um, the late um, 1800s where William Coley, an American bone surgeon, discovered tumor regression in patients um, that were also infected and he um, had bacterial infections and he also deliberately infected um, or injected in bacteria into, into tumors and saw regression. Now, um, this concept kind of died a bit down because of the rise of radiation therapy and also back then uh, uh, there was no containment for antibiotics. Um, but we are right now experiencing a renaissance of this concept thanks to synthetic biology. And um, as we have a whole arsenal now of, of, of toolkits really to, um, to engineer bacteria um, with certain traits, um, we can uh, attenuate them, they can have certain onboard toxin production, they already release, of course, also bacterial adjuvants. Um, they can be used in, um, in, in cancer therapy um, and they have an, an, um, and they have a, a, a autonomous tumor homing in that sense that they have chemotaxis, they um, amplify, they like to colonize tumors in hypoxic regions, at least certain strains. So there's lots of advantages for them that they could actually, when they extravasate from a blood vessel, have a, some self-propulsion to move into tumor tissue. I need to speed a bit up, but uh, so basically huge timeline. We have also to, uh, should be noted that there is actually already a use of bacterial vaccines since the 70s, 80s. And uh, we are now in really a clinical trials with, um, with um, uh, genetically, with attenuated strains, genetically modified bacteria for cancer therapy. Um, there's a lot on the rise with living therapeutics, but we do have the need for more control and containment. And this is um, uh, something I'm working on. We have recently published a, a review on that of different ways of how we can with external control and different um, schemes basically gain more control and uh, to, for better safety and, and containment of, of living organisms as therapeutic. Um, deliver as therapeutic tools or also as delivery vehicles. So here um, in this last project, I want to show is really how we want to empower these bacteria with magnetism for um, delivery um, here of a liposomal payload um, and using our magnetic actuation scheme to help their transport. And um, basically just here's some results that we just recently um, got out on BioArchive, but we tested our system. So here basically again with carbodiamide um, chemistry uh, coupled um, liposomes to the um, membrane of these magnetotactic bacteria that we tested in a transvel system with a cell monolayer and then also in a 3D tumor model and then we went in vivo. So we basically applied um, uh, these rotational magnetic, um, these different, we, we compared these different schemes of um, of controlling these bacteria. So with a directing magnetic field, with rotating magnetic fields in plane and then out of plane, which really shows nicely this, um, this coupling, um, uh, this fluid dynamic coupling. And we could see that we got um, uh, um, more, most bacteria across um, 
uh, Keiko 2 salmonella, salmonella layer as a very dense cell, cell layer um, with our out of plane actuation without compromising the integrity basically of the salmonella layer afterwards. So this is a luciferase yellow rejection assay, and we saw that um, the cell, uh, the cells, of the salmonella layer was not um, damaged. Um, so here we, you see the results basically from translocation with the same um, scheme across um, um, endothelial cell monolayers. Um, here just diffusion of the liposomal payload, where we basically we measure in the lower chamber basically no signal, and then with our RMF approach could get um, these conjugates um, very successfully over this um, endothelial monolayer. Um, then, but what is happening really here? So um, we, we wanted to understand why this worked so much better. And it's actually um, from uh, with the magnetic torques we can we, we, we exposed them with be an order of magnitude higher um, than their self-propulsion forces. But these forces are still lower than what it takes to actually um, break um, 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 a, a cell junction. So this, um, so based on these um, on on these numbers, we were wondering what what else could be a mechanism here. And so um, we we do know that actually the, the endothelial cell layer is a dynamic gap opening. So they open and close. This was actually a beautiful study. I published in 2019 that is um, uh, kind of capturing or trying to to uh, recapitulate these these dynamics. And so what we found in, in our models is basically that through at a cell mono layer that um, that probably through the surface walking we have a, or this 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 rotational actuation along a cell mono layer, especially at these lower concentrations, we're having less of this this um, dense coupling effect, but we're having a surface exploration and a higher likelihood of of ent um, encountering such gaps through which then they can uh, basically cross through. And so this was um, what, we, what we modeled and it aligned quite well with our experimental results. Another trait, and I'm gonna skip over this now, is that, that we can also inductively detect them using rotating magnetic fields. So this is quite exciting that we can basically not only control them with rotating magnetic fields, but we can also um, add, uh, uh, capture basically their presence by, their, um, by, the, by a voltage that they induce um, in, a, in a pickup coil through the time varying field um, of their rotation. So um, our results in uh, tumor spheroids looked also then very promising with our rotating magnetic field approach, where we basically um, applied it for an hour, then incubated, just washed the spheroids, incubated them, and saw then this nice uh, colonization of the core as we got more of these bacteria ready to start with into um, the rim of the, of the tumor. And we moved um, then uh, further for in vivo results and basically worked with um, immunocompromised bulb C, um, nude mice, and um, that grew flank tumors. And you see here that with um, our group that was exposed to rotational magnetic fields, we got a significantly enhanced accumulation in the tumors. And um, they also retained their magnetism. So the bacteria that accumulated there um, retained uh, magnetic um, as we cultured them from tumor homogenates. And here you can nicely see basically the accumulation and penetration across actually slices um, of these tumor sections. Um, and that we really got um, those yeah, significantly um, better into, um, into the tumors. We are now working on uh, new systems to basically control this actuation only in certain regions of the body to um, have reduce off-target effects. That's um, new work we, um, we, uh, we propose now, working now on, um, on actually the, the uh, making of these coils. And with that, I come to the end of my presentation. I hope I could give you a little an overview of the of different use cases of micro, micro robots in vitro and really also in vivo for diagnostics and therapy. I would um, like to thank my team, collaborators and funding agencies, and of course you for your attention. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry, I'm a bit over time, I think. Uh, no problem, no problem. Excellent, fantastic talk. Um, so many questions came in, uh, let me just read them. One is wonderful research, well done. I appreciate the figures. They really help visualize what's going on. I was wondering if you think shear modulus was the best measure to characterize the matrix slides 15, 18, or if you have considered other measures like Young's modulus, storage loss moduli, or creep relaxation measures. Yeah, no, excellent question. I, um, I think it, um, definitely there would be um, uh, other factors to measure. We're moving though a little bit away from um, the mechanical characterization. This was just based on how the experiments were done and read out what we could extract, but definitely um, 
um, and we're moving now more into using them actually for actuation, but um, uh, excellent point, there could be more to be taken out, but given the, the, the type of, of experimental procedure, this was um, uh, the most sensible readout. Um, can you clarify the reason for not delivering or injecting nano shuttles into the specific region, tumors that need the shuttle? So, because most of the tumors are not, um, I mean, many tumors are not accessible. Of course, if a tumor is well accessible, you, you anyways have surgical removal, um, but then it's also for metastatic, for lesions, from, uh, for metastatic lesions, basically to, um, to get to them. And if you know where they are, then um, you could basically have this actuation scheme at different regions in the body. If, um, and then some are basically also um, not, um, not very well accessible. Um, it's also true for pancreas or also a glioblastoma. Nice, um, thank you. Uh, could you please mention if this technology can be used with CAR T cell therapy? Yeah, so yeah, also great question. So we, um, we are thinking of um, if we could also magnetize basic, so what we already, um, investigating now is um, that we um, magnetically functionalize um, uh, uh, cells. So we're working now with um, E. coli nissel bacteria that um, are actually already in, in clinical trials, um, or also Salmonella, Tiferium, BNP 2009. Now for CAR T cells, that is also something that um, was brought to us from also uh, clinical collaborators. Um, we're not, we, we think that um, it is harder because they're much, much larger. We have huge um, drag forces and how effectively we can magnetically functionalize them is also a question, but it's definitely something we think is doable and would love to explore in the future. Thank you. Uh, to what extent you speculate differences between 3D or in vitro models like HeLa cells versus in vivo models in terms of stroma stiffness dynamics? Have you also utilized any animal models? Um, that's also great. So I think here we really, um, uh, so no, we have, we have only used in these, uh, we have only worked with these in vitro models and very simplified in, in collagen. I think there's a, a huge difference also what you would see in terms, I mean, I'm not sure what you, the, the difference in, in stroma stiffness dynamics. Um, it is, I think, from a, as we want to analyze and also single cells embedded there, I think what we can, um, or then not single, I mean, on a single cell level, but what we get from spheroids, I think it compares as all other spheroid studies. And as we're moving now to these um, experiments where we're working really in collagen matrix with, um, with spheroids embedded, though uh, patient-derived cancer cells, so hoping to get the most physiological, physiologically relevant data out of it, um, how it compares, I guess, is very hard to, to say. Also, the integration of our probing particles into tissues would cause too much damage to really get a comparative, um, um, comparative uh, result for that. Um, but I would say it compares as, as other in vitro 3D tumor spheroid studies that we're moving now into. Thank you. Uh, what is the promise of your approach? Uh, brain tumors to brain tumors with compromised blood brain barrier? Um, with... can, you, uh, can you use your nano uh, delivery or micro robot delivery to deliver drugs to brain yeah. with compromised yeah, yeah. BBB? Yes, um, I mean, so that is um, also what we're considering um, that this approach could um, indeed. Um, um, Yes, indeed, that, that, as I mentioned, the example before, glioblastoma would be a, a great target as well. How do you, con thank you, how do you control the aggregation of nanocrystals in the movie in vitro? In the... In the movie in vitro. Are they, they're coming together. Uh, it's not, I mean, we can't control it, unfortunately. So, and we also don't want them to aggregate, or it's, an, it's a disadvantage that they aggregate, right? Because then we get these heterogeneities um, of, the, of the fluid profile. They don't um, just fall up 
part afterwards any more often because then I've just not achieved this uh, adhesive sticking. So we try to to prevent it. And it's basically, I mean, we have chaining effects that basically then also help this um, this flow. But then the agglomeration is basically for the synthetic nanocrystals is not what we can uh, control. And that's where the advantage of these magnetotactic bacteria comes in as they do not agglomerate, they maintain basically, and they have a quite nice homogeneous size distribution. Did you also study the effect of diffusion on the moment of those particles? Probably sub and super diffusive environments have different behaviors, especially in the case of stiffened ECM such as cardiac ECM. Sorry, I, I'm reading this question. Did, you, did the effect of diffusion on the... Um, so our controls are all basically diffu just diffusion based. Um, I mean, we haven't studied different conditions of the diffusive environment. So basically um, always just it's always our control, um, just looking and comparing to diffusion. But it's um, of course interesting that we could alter these conditions also. That's also a great um, input. Yes, especially um, we could actually also vary the pressure in the microfluidic devices to maybe mimic or come closer to interstitial fluid pressure potentially. Also, yeah, great, um, great thought, but we haven't done this um, yet. Thank you. Does the magnetic generator change systemic ferrospheric balance of the body? Do you ever evaluate this factor in patient and healthy ones? Do you think about parasite larva for reaching the target? Uh, yeah, no, these forces would be way too small to affect um, any of the, um, uh, or to affect any uh, ferros fer fer ferrospheric balance in the body. As, um, um, so I can, yeah, we wish we, would, could, we could apply higher forces, but um, um, for our nanocarriers, but no, so that, that would not affect that. Um, and, um, and plus also, if you think so, our field magnitudes are way lower. Um, I, I think I haven't even mentioned that, but they're we apply around 20 millitesla compared to an MRI, which the standard ones are 1.5 now, 1.5 Tesla. And um, uh, we have actually much higher ones um, out in clinics already. And then the frequency is also much lower. So we, you, since the MRI is safe, then this is even um, less concern. Thank you. One final question. Did you correlate magnetic actuation with drug release? Is there any influence on the magnetically induced actuation on the delivery of the specific drugs? Oh, you, sorry, I'm not sure if I, uh, can you repeat this question on there? Yeah, can you correlate magnetic actuation with drug release? If you're releasing drugs, does the yeah. actuation help? Um, also super interesting. So we, um, depending, so you mean if, if it's, I, I assume it's meant, so we have a, a nano carrier that encapsulates mm -hmm. a drug and better that release. Yeah. So we're really interested, um, uh, in, in, in shear based release, um, pot so potentially then also triggering this at a higher frequency of rotation. Um, right now it's basically more for us of bringing it there and then just relying also on diffusion out of the um, out of a liposome that, that would act as a carrier, but potentially um, um, it, it already is low um, or it might already affect this, um, which, um, however, we didn't see this actually in, in some studies we tried with the liposome formulation we have, but potentially with um, uh, modified ones that uh, respond more to shear. Excellent. Well, that's all the questions I have. Thank you for your time for this fantastic talk, Simona. I appreciate it. Thank you. It was such a pleasure. Thank you very much. And I see.